On this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, it is Mailbag Monday, and I will be answering your questions from my inbox on the likes of Imani Bates, Grant Nelson, and Julian Strother. Stay tuned. Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. Wishing everyone a happy Monday. Hope everybody had a great weekend. I know I had a, a pretty good weekend. Unfortunately, my Bengals lost. I'm a childhood Bengals fan. I've been a Bengals fan since Boomer and Icky Woods, James Brooks, yada, yada, yada. Now, I don't watch a lot of football and I haven't watched a full football game in probably like six or seven years. So I tried to watch the game yesterday, and unfortunately, it's just my, my, my team my team lost. And my mom is a Patrick Mahomes fan, so I had to deal with her sending me a bunch of messages. But other than that, I had a great weekend. And before we get into this episode, I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. That is prizepicks.com. Promo code locked on. I forgot to introduce myself. I am Rafael Barlow, your host, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board, and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies.com. All right. So I had a bunch of questions, and I'm starting to get a lot in my inbox or even on, on YouTube. I try to answer as many as I can. Um, but I'm a little, I guess I could be a little long winded on these episodes. I may not get to all of them, but I will um, try my best. All right. So the first question from my inbox that caught my attention is what are your thoughts on Judah Mintz? And Judah Mintz is someone that coming into the season, I, he had a little bit of buzz. Some people thought that he was a, a potential one and done guy. He may or may not decide to come out I think it's in his best interest to return to school I like the creativity I like the handle I think he has good size at 6'3 needs to put on some weight I think he's listed at like a buck 70 something like that I like the court vision there's a lot of flash to it and sometimes I, I can like the, I can like really confident passers and playmakers the, the like the ball handling shifty creative he despite the fact that he is real thin he is someone that is not afraid of contact he draws files at a high rate he's a fearless driver loves to get to the paint loves to get to his sweet spots and even though he's a pretty good finisher at the rim his touch around the basket as far as like making soft touch floaters is excellent I think he has excellent touch and he is someone that can score a little bit off the ball you can run him through Iverson cuts and screens I like him. I just think that he needs to come back to school. I think if he comes back to school, he'll be one of the better sophomores in the country next year. Like I said, he needs to get stronger, and he needs to really, really improve as a shooter. The three-point shooting is not there. He's capable of making some, but he's not really efficient. He really struggles off the catch. He is he used to having the ball in his hands. And then his bread and butter is kind of like his his – scoring off the dribble while the floater is deadly I think he needs to improve as a pull-up shooter but overall I like him and I think that if he returns to school he's definitely going to enter next season as a projected first round pick maybe even lottery so that's my thoughts on Judah Mintz all right the next question is Tucker DeVries and Baylor Shireman what is the difference um, I had Tucker DeVries as a second round pick on my last mock. And that's a good question. What's the difference between Tucker DeVries and Baylor Shireman? I like Baylor a lot. I am from Nebraska, and Omaha to be exact. And coming into this season, I had Baylor Shireman as a guy that was, he was definitely in my my draft guide. I thought he had second round potential after coming off a, a strong Three years at, I think it was at South Dakota State. I love the shooting, the passing. Once a game, he makes a, a, a pass that just makes you say, wow. I think why I have Tucker over him right now is just because Tucker is a little bit younger. And I think that will... 
play a role in him possibly potentially getting drafted ahead of Shireman. I think Shireman's going to obviously have some opportunities, probably going to work out for a bunch of teams, which I imagine he's going to shoot the cover off the ball. And I think that he will get a, a good opportunity in summer league. Tucker is, like I said, he's younger. And I, I like the fact that he has a little bit of stuff in this game to where he can attack closeouts, not blowing by you off the dribble or, you know, shake and bake, but he does take advantage of mismatches. If you have a smaller guy on him, he's going to, he's going to go to work, get to his spots and shoot over him and shoot over smaller guys. And it's funny because it's not necessarily putting all guys into the same category, but I had someone say, well, what's the difference between Tucker DeVries and Grady Dick? And this particular person felt like there was not a huge difference between those two players. And, you know, I mean, it's definitely something that is, can be up for discussion. And I think um, I think that Dick is obviously the better prospect. You know, you can say by a wide margin, um, I think Grady Dick is going to be a, a lottery pick, 6'8". He is probably a little bit more athletic and probably has a little bit more diversity to his game. But overall, I mean, you're not wrong for, for wondering what's the biggest difference between Tucker DeVries and Baylor Shireman. I just have DeVries as a potential second-round pick because he is a little younger, but I think Shireman is the much better passer and playmaker, which could end up being the, the difference or the, between who gets drafted and who doesn't. All right, speaking of Creighton, the next question is about Arthur Kaluma. Kaluma was someone that I thought was going to be a first-round pick. I had him right outside of my lottery coming into the season. I wouldn't say he's had a disappointing season, but he hasn't made the the progress and the jump that I expected, especially considering that after the Kansas game last year in the NCAA tournament, I, I thought that. You know, he had a real good opportunity to test the waters. That was probably, you know, the best performance that he'll be able to have on, on such a bright stage. And sometimes, I mean, you got to capitalize when, when your name is hot. And I, I thought that that was a good opportunity for him to at least test the waters and, and see, um, you know, what what's out there and get some, some good feedback. Maybe he did. I don't know. But this year, the stats, the last time I looked are – Similar, maybe a little bit of improvements, but not enough. And the biggest area for improvement for him is the outside shooting. I think the outside shooting opens up everything for his game. And I was watching the Xavier game this weekend, and the commentator labeled him as a stretch four. I thought that was, I thought that was pretty crazy because the shot is inconsistent. He has a style of play that seems to me like it's built for like the 90s. Is really based off a lot of power, not necessarily finesse, even though he can't put the ball on the floor. Um, he definitely prefers to drive. I think if he became a respectable three-point shooter, then it would open up his driving. A little undersized, more so of a four than a three, but he has the the the. I mean, he has the game to where he can take slower bigs out on the perimeter and get to the rim and attack and draw fouls. And then if he is knocking down shots or teams are switching, then he has, like, the strength to, like, bully smaller opponents and, and be able to create some mismatches there. I don't think he's a first-round pick as of now. Creighton is trending in the right direction after having, a, like, a weird stretch of games where they just lost. <laughs> like, I mean, I had Creighton as a top-five team coming into the season. But it seems like they're they are putting it together. They had a big win this weekend. I think Kaluma's draft stock has dropped a little bit. But if he has a strong finish to the season, then he could end up right back where I, I had him. But I think it's somewhat of a long shot. All right. Last question. Actually, you know what? Let's take a quick break. When we return, I'll talk about Julian Strother, who has been on a tear lately. But before I get into what Julian has done, let's talk about prize picks. And if you're not familiar with prize picks, it is daily fantasy made easy. And you can pick up to two to six players, and you will decide if they will score more or less than their prize picks projection. You can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. 
and Prize Picks offers projections on any sport you watch: NBA, NFL. So I know the Super Bowl is gonna be big. You have college football, men's college basketball, women's college basketball, soccer, tennis, MMA, boxing, even Euro League basketball. They even have cricket. And the entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It is that easy. It is safe and fast withdrawals, and it is currently operational in over 30 states and our buddies north of the border in Canada. So download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. If you are a first-time user, you can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code Locked On. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50 prize picks will give you fifty dollars do not forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for instant deposit match up to one hundred dollars all right once again you are listening to the locked on nba big board podcast and i'm your host rafael barlow and i'm just going down a few questions that surfaced in my inbox over the last week all right the next question is about gonzaga's julian strother and the question just says julian strother first rounder He's in the discussion. I still have him as a second round pick, but I cannot deny how well he's played of late. Had a 40 point game. He had a game winning shot recently. He was someone that coming into the season, I thought that he was a top 40 prospect. He has the positional size and he has a defined NBA role as a shooter. I'm a little concerned about the release, the low release point on his shot. And um, just a little bit concerned on if he is a great shooter. I think that he is a good shooter, which is fine. I think he's a good shooter. But my concern was, is he a great enough or consistent enough shooter to stick in the NBA? He's currently shooting 43% from three. 48% overall and 73% from the foul line. He's doing a good job on the glass. He's averaging seven rebounds per game. Now, the 43% is good. It's it's very good. Um, But I don't know what he does if he's, well, I guess you could say rebounding. But if he's having an off shooting night, then I don't really know what he, he brings to the table. The big knock on him for me is just the assist. I mean, he and maybe it's the system but his assist numbers are extremely extremely low i don't think he's averaged an assist per game in his three years at gonzaga and gonzaga is a team that they score a lot of points and they move the ball so that's just a personal preference there but i do think that there is a a chance that he, he could end up late in the first round especially when teams are in need of wing shooting and he has the size and the shooting and he does rebound so I think there's a chance I personally don't have him as a first rounder. All right, next question. Can Jalen Hood Shafino get more love? I do not think that there's 30 prospects better than him. So I, I guess that's kind of a, in reference to my mock draft, I have him as a high second round pick. And yes, he deserves more love. He is playing well. Um, I had some questions about him coming into this season. I didn't know... I mean, I watched him in high school, but I didn't know exactly how he would fare in college basketball. He has a a unique game. He has the size, size and strength as an elite ball handler. Lacks the ideal, like explosiveness and and like vertical pop around the rim. He is a below-the-rim finisher. And, you know, it's like in this class you have – you know, you have your Scoot Hendersons and you have your your Amon Thompsons who are like explosive athletes. Then you have other guards that are like great three point shooters and shot creators and so on. And Hood Shafino is just he's a little bit different than everybody in this class. But I love his size. And he's actually surprised me a lot with his play this year. I don't think he got off to like a really great start. But with his play overall, I think that he has definitely put himself in position to to be drafted. I mean, he's filling up the stat sheet, averaging a little under 13 points, four boards, 
four assists per game. And at least for me, the biggest surprise is that he's shooting 43% from three on a respectable three attempts per game. Now, the free throw percentage is below 70, which is something I don't like. Coming into the season, I thought that the free throw percentage was pretty indicative of his overall shooting touch. But he's shooting the ball well. He's shooting the ball well from three. And he's going to be one of these players where you have to decide, like, what is the real uh, indicator of his shooting touch? Is it the three-point shooting or is it the free throw percentage? Now, he has great touch around the rim as, as a like a floater, soft-touch finisher. But I know in years past there has been there have there has been guys that have shot over forty percent from three, and I did not a hundred percent believe in the shooting stroke, and their free throw percentage was probably the most accurate indicator of where they were as a shooter. So Hood Shafino is a guy that that's going to be a concern. That's going to be a question going forward. All right, the next question is. Thoughts on Naquan Tomlin. So Naquan Tomlin is, he's a little bit older. He is from Kansas State. He is extremely raw. But when you watch him play, he does some things that stand out, that catch your attention. He's athletic. I like the way he moves at his size. At 6'10", he moves like, kind of like a, a, a wingish, you know, a I put it like this. To me, he moves a little bit like Christian Wood. Not saying that he is Christian Wood, but just the way he moves at his size. And like I said, he's raw. He shows some promise as a shooter. Uh, not efficient by any means right now. Uh, has a very interesting story. I read his, his background. He's from New York. He started playing late, went to a couple junior colleges. And ended up at Kansas State and has just made a name for himself on this Kansas State team that is, I mean, they have to be like the the best story in college basketball. I mean, it's a new coaching staff. They have come in and they have completely turned that program around. You got Keontae Johnson, which is a great comeback story. And Naquan is, has been a, a, a big contributor there. Now, for him, he, he does have another year of eligibility. I believe he's like 22 years old. So he's a little older and he's still raw, but I think there's tremendous upside there. I think he's a project for an agency and a team because, again, there there are some flashes of him being able to shoot. I think he rebounds well and he has the athleticism. So I think that He's more so of a long-term project. It'll be interesting to see if a team decides to use a draft pick on him or he ends up being a two-way guy that they try to develop in the G League. But overall, I like his potential and his upside, even though usually when a guy is 22 years old, you hear the opposite, that he lacks upside and that he's closer to the finished product. But for a guy that just started playing basketball, I think he's made some great strides. All right. Here's a big question. What is up with the Baba Miller hype? He hasn't shown me anything. And that's fair. That is totally fair. I think what Baba, we're talking about a guy who I heard this weekend might be seven foot. Seven foot, guard skills. He missed half the season because of some crazy, I don't even know. I guess a crazy rule that ruled him ineligible because he accepted payments to come to the United States to train for the summer before he committed to Florida State. So they robbed him of his first, I want to say like 11 games. of the, Maybe it was more games, 16 games of the season. I think I got the 11 because he was eligible January 11th. Florida State is kind of easing him into their, well, not necessarily easing him into their rotation, but he, I mean, he's been playing. He's part of their rotation. Florida State is, is struggling if you haven't uh, been keeping up. And he's shown some flashes, but, you know, hasn't come out and set the world on fire by, by any means. But when you watch, you see, like, the skill set. You see that he moves like a guard. He's seven foot, seven two wingspan, has some switchability, needs to put on some weight, very thin. And from what I've been hearing recently 
is that he is almost a lot to come back to school. And one one particular person that I spoke with believes that the John Butler situation is an example of what can happen when you leave school too early. John Butler, for those that don't remember, was kind of like this out of nowhere prospect. He was like a poor man's Chet Holmgren <laughs> that uh, left school early despite showing some flashes. And last I heard, he's on the two way and he didn't get drafted. And I think that he really could have used a year of developing in college basketball, especially if it's a money issue. They could have found some NIL money for him. So I think that has played a role in, in Baba potential po, ha, with the possibility. I don't know why I can't say the word this morning, but the possibility of him coming back to school as a sophomore. I think if he comes back to school as a sophomore, I think without a doubt, he would be a projected top 10 pick just due to his size athleticism fluidity promise as a shooter and he'll have a a full year under his belt all right when we return i'll round out these questions but let's talk about turbo tax because it is close to tax time and do not do your taxes go to turbo tax and let turbo tax do your taxes meet with the expert who will do them for you TurboTax experts can relieve you from the stress of taxes and file for you so you can do other things like not do your taxes. With TurboTax, an expert will do your taxes from start to finish, ensuring your taxes are done right. Guaranteed so you can relax. So doesn't it feel good to be done with your taxes? Because if you take them to TurboTax, they're doing for you. Come to TurboTax and please do not do your taxes. Visit TurboTax.com to learn more. Full service products only. Video meeting while experts does your taxes is required. So see guaranteed details at TurboTax.com slash guarantee. All right, last segment. And I finished talking about Bye Bye Miller. And here is a, a good question. Out of the potential first round picks, who is the best shooter in this class? And that is a question that we're probably going to hear until... Until draft time. I mean, you can say Brandon Miller is the best shooter. There's a case for Grady Dick. There's a case for Jet Howard. There's a strong case for Jordan Hawkins. Um, I'm probably leaving somebody off, but Bryce Sensenbaugh is, is shooting a over 45% from three. So this class is loaded with wings, and this class does have good shooting. Honestly, coming into this season, I did not think this class had enough shooting and they have caught me by surprise i mean jet is someone that has kind of come out of nowhere to be in the mid first round even lottery range since some ball wasn't a name that i thought was going to be a first round pick coming into the season then you have guys like taylor Hendricks, who are shooting well um yes i mean there is some good shooting in this class and i think that it's what makes this class so interesting because it's loaded with wings that can shoot the ball. And it's going to be interesting just to see who falls and, and, and how teams value the different wings. Now, there are some some wings that I believe are better shooters than their numbers. Like, for example, Keontae George. Every shot looks like it's going in. His game is, I mean, his his game is pretty to me and I'm always amazed at how his shot does not fall like it like it looks like every shot looks good um but I think he's a better shooter than the numbers we're missing Nick Smith in a sense um because he's only been able to play three games I think he is one of the better more so of a scorer than shooter but I think he he could throw his name in the hat as one of the better shooters in this class so it's it's a debate who the best shooter is. I think right now I'd probably go with between who I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. Uh like I said, Jordan Hawkins has a huge degree of difficulty on his shots. He's coming off pin downs. And uh Grady Dick has the size of shoot over guy. I mean, I don't know. It's 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 some good shooters in this particular class. And I can't even forget about Chris Murray. Chris Murray is is one of the better shooters also. And speaking of shooters, here is a question that I've been getting a lot, if maybe not worded this exact way, but a lot of questions about Imani Bates. And the question here is why isn't Imani Bates a projected lottery pick? And I have an article that's coming out. It should be out by the end of the day, Monday, 
Imani Bates. I spoke with multiple scouts about Imani Bates' draft range, and it is extremely wide. I've heard first round in the 20s. I've heard top 40. I've heard mid to late second round, and I even heard two-way. A lot of different opinions on Imani Bates. He is 18 years old. He's shooting 36% from three. He's averaging 20 points per game. He's a bucket. He can definitely get buckets. He can score. He's averaging, like I said, 20 points a game. He's more than doubled his average from his freshman year at Memphis last year where, let's just say it was a, a rough year. His draft range can also be dependent on uh, the intel, I think that could be a factor. One thing that scouts brought up was he's on a losing team. He's on a team that is in second to last place in the MAC. Um, his style of play is is a bit of concern. But you know what? Check out the article. Check out the article at NBABigBoard.com. And, you know, I have my opinion on it. But hearing it from three different scouts, what three different scouts gave me three different answers on this draft range. But I was able to interview five, five different scouts. And like I said, one guy had him in the 20s. Another guy thought that he needs a year to develop in the G League as far as the working on his defense, his maturity and his passing. Um, a scout brought up that there was a game that he went to where it was just heavy ISO, poor body language. Um, Another scout mentioned, I didn't put this in the article, but another scout mentioned that there was a game that it looked like he was getting ready to leave the team and walk out and um, had to be basically talked into returning to the bench. Now, there's multiple opinions on that. Some say that maybe he was going to the locker room to cool off because he's such a fiery competitor, but... You know, the scouts that were in the in attendance, and it wasn't like a big crowd. They probably were able to hear a little bit more of the dialogue that was that was taking place. But it's it's going to be interesting because, you know, on one hand, you can say, man, this guy is is a victim of his own early success. You know, being on the cover of Sports Illustrated at 15, put this humongous microscope on his game and. You know, would he be evaluated differently if we never heard of him and if he was just a kid that came out of nowhere named Imani Bates? And I think that's a fair question. But I don't think anybody has him as a lottery pick. But like I said, I've seen someone say that they have him as a first rounder on on their board. So check out the article, NBABigBoard.com, and it is about the Imani Bates dilemma. And I interview multiple scouts and share my own opinions. All right. A couple more questions. My Raptors are in the lottery and might be sellers at the deadline. Who should I be looking for that would be a good fit? Um, well, you know, Masai has a history of of drafting guys with African ties. He has a history of drafting long athletic guys. Uh, so <laughs> if you if you look at it from that route, I think guard play may be something that they may be interested in and in, in shooting. You know, all the rumors about Fred Van Vliet being possibly on the move could tell me that they're maybe looking for a point guard. But I've been wrong before. Like, I personally thought it was a lock that Toronto was going to select Jalen Suggs a couple years ago, especially after losing Kyle Lowry. And they ended up selecting Scotty Barnes, who was the rookie of the year. So you just never know. I think Masai... Masai Uriji, who's their general manager, has the luxury of being able to draft who he wants to draft. It doesn't have to follow the consensus. If he thinks, I don't know, Leonard Miller is a top 10 pick, then he'll select him number one. While there may be another GM that feels like Leonard Miller is a top 10 pick, but will say, well, I'm not going to select him at number 10 because that that is considered a reach. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So Masai is going to select who he wants to select. And I would assume guard play, but you just never know. All right. Last all right, two more questions. Is the Grant Grant Nelson hype real? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I spoke with a scout recently about Grant Nelson and he 
specializes in covering mid majors and lower conferences. So he had been aware of Grant Nelson for the last couple of years. He's just kind of appalled by all the recent hype and social media frenzy that he's caused. And he's mentioned that he's he's known the name. He's familiar with him. I spoke with an agent who had mentioned that he had interest in Grant Nelson last year. So, you know, it's like the social media buzz has created this monster, which has been good for Grant Nelson because I've seen him shoot up boards and even mine. I mean, I have him as a second round pick, a particular executive from a team told me that his team doesn't have anybody on their roster that finishes around the rim at that size that can do what he does so they're intrigued and they have interest in you know um, evaluating him a little bit more he has a game coming up against Oral Roberts that I hear like multiple scouts are going to be there simply because a lot of scouts want to go to North Dakota which is understandable at this time of year I mean, it's very risky flying into the Midwest in the middle of the winter because there's a chance you could end up being stuck for an extra couple of days. But I think the hype is real. He's still young, only 20 years old, has some upside as a shooter, definitely needs to improve as a shooter. Curious to see what happens. I think he should definitely test the waters, um, but there's going to be talk about transferring. You know, some of the, the bigger schools in a Power Five are probably just – waiting to see what his decision is but yes the hype is real all right last question why isn't kj simpson on your board kj simpson is a sophomore from colorado that is having a really good season under the radar um definitely deserves a little bit more love has very good passing instincts as a ball mover he's unselfish great touch around the rim has decent size at 6'2 but at 6'2 he's a very very good rebounder he chases long rebounds good motor crafty score I think the biggest concern with him is that he's not an explosive athlete and he's really inefficient at the rim and that even though he is a scorer he like I said he's not great finishing at the rim and he is not a very good shooter off the catch. So he does most of his damage in pick and roll, which is very good. And he is a, a guy that just is very efficient scoring off the dribble. There's a chance that he, I think he should test the waters and come back next year. And I think next year he will be someone that will be in a first round discussion. Well, thank you so much for listening to me answer these questions that wraps up this episode and thank you for making the locked on nba big board podcast your first listen of the day now for your second listen you got to check out the game to game nba podcast every moment every top performance every result locked on game to game covers every game from across the nba with local analysis that only locked on can deliver so follow game to game on locked on nba it is available on the odyssey app youtube or wherever you get your podcast once again this is rafael barlow and i am out